Welcome to another podcast. Today I want to talk about something that's a little, um, uh, it's a tough issue and it's something that people face and something that when people face this, it's super, super controversial. And the issue is when a dog becomes aggressive or is no longer able to be kept by a person and the decision has to be made whether to put this dog down or what to do with them. So recently I got an email and I'm going to look up that email here with you guys on the phone and I want to share it with you because it's really important and it's heartfelt and it's kind of in response to a podcast that I did quite some time ago about when to put a dog down for aggression. So, uh, you know, I read a lot of emails, I get a lot of correspondence from people and they mean a lot to me and, and when they're really deep like this, I take them to heart. First of all, whenever somebody compliments me and says how I helped you guys with your dogs and, and how it affects me, I read these emails. Sometimes I don't have a chance to respond, but I get them, I read them, they mean a lot to me. So thank you for sending them to me and thank you for trusting me with your dogs, with their safety, with their lives, with their training, with everything, because it's an important thing that I do. I consider what I do very important, I should say. and. Um, I take it seriously. I take it really, really seriously. Training your dog is the most important thing you're going to do to them. The life you give them is one of the most important things you're going to do to them. What you feed them, what you surround them with, all these things are important. I've been doing this for 12 plus years. And in that time, I've seen probably a lot more dogs than people who have been doing this for twice as long because of my work in shelters and the the work I've done. with rescues and such. So let me share this email with you. I'm going to withhold the person's name and I'm just going to read it to you. And it's a very moving email. It says, hi, Robert, I came across your YouTube video on when to euthanize an aggressive dog. I'll keep this short, but your video really impacted me as we've been struggling immensely with this decision. We adopted a pit mix from the shelter nine months ago, and I've been dealing with significant leash reactivity, isolation, separation anxiety, aggressive tendencies, not towards my husband and I, reactivity, aggression towards strangers, dogs, children, on walks, significant barrier aggression, and fence fighting. Shortly after adopting our dog, we... we, uh, we found out we were pregnant and started to become concerned with our dog's behaviors. A four-year-old child lives next door and she growls at him with raised hackles through our door. This is my worst fear if she ever escaped so we double lock our fence and keep our doors locked. We can't have people over nor travel because no one can watch her. She also has some serious prey drive and our trainer said that it was pretty concerning, considering we're bringing a newborn into the house. She is sweet as sugar with my husband and I, but did bite my brother and did bite a dog that was off leash. On Saturday, we brought our dog to the shelter with the intention of giving her back and then turned around because we knew this was going to be basically, she was going to basically be unadoptable. It would be no life for her in the shelter and a risk to even adopt her out again. We are now going to euthanize her, and while the decision has been grueling, you really drove the big points home. I don't want to pass the problems off onto someone else out of fear they won't be as vigilant with keeping her in the bubble, or they'll use aggressive training tactics. It's also a good point about the average person walking into the shelter isn't the miracle person we all hope these dogs will get adopted by, and that the magical farm in the country for reactive and aggressive dogs to live out their days doesn't exist. Thank you for the video. It was sort of a dose of reality that I needed to know that we were doing the right thing. And I wrote back to to her, I said, thank you so much for writing and sharing um, you and your husband's difficult decision. I feel for you and totally understand what you're going through. You would have done her no favors by dropping her at the shelter because eventually the fate would fall onto someone else and it would certainly cost another dog his or her life. You're doing the right thing. I go on and on anyway. And I asked permission if um, I could use this email. Again, I didn't mention her name, so I could probably use it no matter what. But um, she again mentioned that, you know, her and her husband are really having a hard time with this, blah, blah, blah. Um, It's been heart-wrenching, but with her significant anxiety and issues already mentioned, we feel she's suffered enough in this world. And that's really the case, right? Here's a dog that through no fault of her own 
And I say this because dogs don't generally have this aggressiveness, this crazy, crazy aggressiveness, unless it was either bred into them, trained into them, or allowed to manifest by lack of structure and socialization. So neglect is often the cause for poor behavior. Dogs that are neglected, that aren't socialized, that aren't trained, that aren't given structure, that aren't given proper uh, training or affection or anything, run this risk of this feral nature. And pits, in general, are going to have more of a likelihood of this. And, and stop before you, before you say I'm being prejudiced or breed specific against pits. Let me explain something to you. Pits all along have been good dogs for many, many years. People will tell you this, that they're nanny dogs or this or that. However, because of their kind nature, their bond towards people, they're easily manipulated, just like a shepherd would be or a, a breed similar bonding to a person. A lab. Okay, another one. If the dog has this immense trust towards a person and, and forms this immense bond with a person, they will do whatever the person conditions them to do. Now, with a dog like a lab, it's not in their nature to be extremely dominant. It can be in a dog like a Rottweiler or a Doberman or you know, a more of a dominant breed dog. Labs are not dominantly bred dogs. Border Collies are not dominantly bred dogs. German Shepherds are dominant. So these dogs can be bred to be aggressive. I'll give you an example. When we breed a, uh, a protection dog, we're looking for characteristics in that dog that don't shut off when it comes to pressure. So in other words, the dog is barking, is being aggressive, he's being dominant, he's being pushy. If I put pressure on that dog and that dog shuts down, the dog doesn't really wa work out and therefore will wash out. We're looking for a dog that doesn't back down to that pressure. So the dogs that you'll see working in protection and even in bite sports, in civil work, police work, these are dogs that don't easily back down to pressure. And then those dogs are bred further. If you were to do that with a lab, you wouldn't be breeding labs. But you can do it with dominantly bred dogs, such as shepherds, dobermans, rottweilers, uh, and pits. So pits through the generation, when they started fighting these dogs, they would find the dogs that would obviously be more dominant. They wouldn't back down to another dog's advances, aggression, uh, dominance challenges, or anything like that. And when those dogs didn't back down to that, they could harness their innate aggressiveness, which we all have an innate aggressiveness. It's a defensive drive. These pit bulls would then be bred for fighting, and the best fighters were bred further. The weaker ones were culled, and they were shocked to death. They were, you know, there's a great video that I'm going to, at some point, I'll put up and I'll do a commentary on it that I saw online that really showed the dark side of, of dog fighting. So, this is what was bred into these dogs, and some of it cross-contaminated. Some of these dogs would obviously, you know, with, within these fighting lines, within these traits that were negative to most, but positive to people who wanted to fight their dogs, these traits would then further pass along and pass along and pass along. And of course, on accident, this dog got out and got that dog pregnant, and so that a little bit of that drive was in this dog, and then that festered over to this dog and over to this dog as this cross-pollination of breeding happened. Because it was obviously, uh, I don't think dog fighters are going to be the most um, kindest people. They're the most uh, everly watchful people of their breed. So um, as that happened, you start, to see, you start to see more of it move over and, and dogs became, you know, in, in this breed, became more and more aggressive. They had these dog aggression issues. And that's why, even as she said here, the dog shows no real aggression to her and her husband. That's totally common. One of the most common things that I hear with pit bull owners, and again, people are going to say, well, a pit bull isn't a breed. It's a classification of dog, and we kind of know what we're talking about. Really good trainers will say, okay, it's a pit mix, whether it's a boxer mix, a rot mix, or something like that. If it's a, if it's a, 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 um, a molisher type dog, they're gonna classify it 
into this family. We can say it with mastiffs, we can say it whatever, but here we're talking about a mastiff type dog, a, a molisher type dog, a, 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 a stout, strong dog that has terrier in it as well. And the terrier in it is going to make it even more tenacious because terriers notoriously are bred to hunt vermin. So they have more aggressive nature in them than say a Labrador. Terriers are tenacious, tenacious dogs. Look at Airedale Terrier. All, all terriers come from a similar area, so they all have the same innate type drive and characteristics. They were bred to hunt out vermin. It takes a lot of dog to, to hunt out vermin. So when these dogs were then transferred over and that aggression was channeled towards other dogs, they became very, very aggressive and their prey drives was elevated. And when they have these crazy fight drives in them, it's very, very hard to stop it, right? The only people who would handle dogs like this would be very strong men, obviously. I don't know if any women ever fought dogs. Maybe they do. I don't imagine women being that uh, moronic to do that. I have more respect for women than men in this situation because I do think it's a mostly a male, macho, moron sport. So what ends up happening is a dog like this, through no fault of their own, is, is born and... Um, gets into the system. It's not socialized early on, it's not trained early on, it's not given structure early on, so the dog has no hope for any better life than what it gets, which is a crappy, crappy life. And that crappy life in a dog like a pit bull that ends up in the shelter is usually the worst because they'll end up in multiple homes before they're ever a year old. So they never get this consistent exposure to one um, thing. So one person handling them, one person feeding them, one person training them and, and this structure. It's like a child who's passed through foster care, through numerous homes. Their chances of success, of ending up successful in life is going to be much lower than a child that was raised in a nuclear family with a mother and a father. That's just, that's just a fact. Now, this dog ends up in the shelter and these kind people adopt the dog in hopes of giving the dog a better chance. They put themselves at great risk, right? And I'm not saying at great risk because again, rarely will the pit bull, this, this pit bull, this breed we're talking about, the shelter pit mix, attack its owners, right? Because they become extremely bonded because they, they're, they're clinging on to whatever they can get. They don't have a solid structure in their, at their core. So when they get so connected, they become extremely defensive against other things, other things that might threaten that. Whether that's a child, a bicycle, another dog, it's, they're becoming very protective over that. The other side of it is because of lack of exposure. So you, you have multiple angles hitting this at one time. You have no real socialization, so the dog doesn't know to accept the other dogs. You have no real structure or training, so the dog doesn't know to listen to the people. And you have a dog that's becoming overly protective because oftentimes a lack of structure is not imposed, a lack of structure is not a good thing. A dog that's given structure that understands I must listen and I'm made to listen will often give the time, give the dog the opportunity to make good decisions or actually almost force them to make good decisions. So training is not only something we do to build a stronger bond with us, but also to build a decision-making process in the dog that the dog knows that he must decide to do the right thing and to listen to us. So when this dog ends up in the home, they've tried, they, they tried and actually consulted a trainer. I mean, what amazing uh, work this husband and wife did here. And now they're, be, they're becoming pregnant or she's pregnant, she's gonna have a child. And a dog with a high degree of prey drive, especially I don't think these people were able to probably give the dog the um, physical corrections, the physical boundaries that this dog probably needed. Somebody, a really strong handler, maybe could manage this dog. Chances are these people couldn't. And what a powerful statement to make that 
the dog is seeing this child, this four-year-old child, and its hackles come up and starts growling. If the dog's hackles are coming up and it's growling and it's getting stiff and these things are happening, they have to lock their doors and the fence so that the dog doesn't go attack and kill a child. And this happens, right? A Malinois killed a child not too long ago. I've read several stories of pits, you know, and mastiffs and, and, and these kind of dogs killing children. This is a huge liability. And having the courage to actually put a dog like this down is a noble, noble, noble thing to do. It's a noble thing to do. And I'm going to tell you why. Because the decision could be so easy to take this dog back to the shelter and say, you know, it didn't work. I don't really want the dog. We can't keep the dog. And even if they say, you know, we have a feeling the dog is aggressive. Unless they come out and say, this dog bit somebody severely. Unless they give that indication, chances are the shelter's going to adopt the dog out to somebody else. And when they do, they place someone else at great risk. And that risk is not only to the people, but to somebody else's dog, to you walking your dog down the street. And this dog gets off the leash. It, it uh, gets out of its gate. It uh, gets out of its front door. The gardener left the gate open. Something. And the dog mauls and kills your dog. Or bites your child. Or bites you. Because the people know, telling them what they know, telling them clearly this dog is aggressive is oftentimes not enough for a shelter to say, we can't adopt this dog out. Some shelters will make that decision. Some SPCAs or humane sites will make that decision, but not with all the feel-good animal rights people who are saying every dog deserves a chance. Saying every dog deserves a chance doesn't give a fair chance to dogs that really deserve a chance, such as a dog that's done nothing wrong. If a dog has already shown its tendency to bite, to attack, to act aggressively, that dog should deserve less of a chance than a dog who hasn't shown those, those tendencies. And lying, bringing a dog to a shelter, and oftentimes when dogs are dumped in shelters, there's a great lie that goes on. And that lie is most often the opposite of what we would think. So in other words, if a dog has bitten and the people feel guilty thinking the dog might be put down because it bit, they won't disclose that the dog bit. And then people who are feeling guilty about giving their dog up because they're just low lives will say, oh, the dog tried to attack me and label the dog as aggressive. Right? It's because people have lack character and they lack the ability to do the right thing. Which is, again, going back to this email, this couple made the right decision. They drove to the shelter and then thought about it again. And thank God that I put out this podcast, this previous podcast, and explained to people that doing the right thing might involve making a tough decision. Sometimes doing the right thing is a hard decision, but it's the the correct thing to do in the long run. When you find the easy way out and you think to yourself, well, I'm just going to dump the dog because then it's off your shoulders, right? In other words, well, I left the dog there. The dog was fine. I drove away. They were taking the dog inside. The dog was wagging its tail or sad or whatever. Somebody else will probably take the dog. Somebody else is going to probably rehabilitate the dog. The dog is probably going to end up at a farm. The dog is probably going to end up with a trainer but it's not, right? There is no magic farm here somewhere in the United States, the magic ranch, the aggressive dog ranch that can take dogs in that no one else can take. Do you know how many times I've been asked, don't you know of somebody who has a ranch somewhere where this dog can live and be an only dog? Well, first of all, if the dog lives on a ranch, there's other animals around. And most ranches aren't completely fenced in. And other ranchers have other dogs. So that dog would likely kill another dog. So you're putting another dog at incredibly great risk by putting the dog on this imaginary sanctuary farm. 
in the situation where there are these sanctuaries that take these dogs, these dogs don't live in social settings. They live in small confined areas where they might get a little bit of exercise in that confined area, but they can't be around other dogs. Remember, a dog is a pack animal. The dog wants to be among other creatures. It's not like a betta fish, right? It doesn't want to live in an aquarium by itself. It wants to interact with other animals. It wants to interact with other dogs or people or something. That is the innate nature of a dog, is to interact with a person or other animals, dogs, namely. So, by denying them that, you're putting a, an animal that is social in its nature into a isolated setting. And what crueler thing could you, could you do to a creature, and a dog or a person, than to isolate them? And that's what you would be doing in that setting. So the shelter doesn't have this appeal. The shelter keeps the dog in a small kennel, a concrete floor, and steel bars, and hopes someone will come along. Most shelters don't really check out who's going to take their dog. Most municipal larger shelters, they're taking in you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 dogs a day, and hope to be adopting out 10, 20, or 30, 40, uh, 30, 40 dogs a day to keep those numbers even. But it doesn't happen. They'll take in 30 and they'll adopt out 20. I can tell you that. I've worked in enough shelters and I've worked with enough shelter employees and managers to know that that's really the fact. If they were adopting out 40 and taking in 30, there'd be no dogs in the shelters, right? They'd be empty. There'd be people waiting up front, like people are waiting for gym equipment now, because you can't get it during the coronavirus. So for a person to be courageous enough to say, we had to make this hard decision to put our dog down, to have that courage to wake up in the morning and load your dog in your car, a dog that has done nothing wrong to you, but you know in your heart that this dog is a danger to society, to other dogs, to children, to other people, and to drive that dog down the road and park your car at the veterinarian's office and bring that dog inside and hold that dog's head and that dog's body and caress that dog, knowing the dog would not harm you and watch the life drain out of that animal is such a brave and courageous thing to do and it is totally selfless. So when the nutcases start to say, oh, how cruel that is, how mean that is, how stupid that is to not give the dog another chance. My answer to you is, then you take that dog. And you show me what you're able to do with that dog. Because there's plenty of dogs in the shelter, plenty of really good dogs that never get a home, that end up in a barrel with other dogs stacked on top of them because they never got that chance. And then there's dogs that end up because people were so self-righteous that they needed to save the wrong dog that end up with a nice couple like this who thank God, thank God, they had the courageous insight to make a powerful decision to protect other dogs, to protect children in the neighborhood, to protect other people from a dog that could be very, very dangerous, right? It's not a, an 11 pound dachshund. It's a dog with a very strong bite, right? They don't have locking jaws, we know that, but has a very strong tenacious attitude to fight, to bite, to kill. And the dog can't be controlled. And let me tell you something, there's trainers out there and rescues who will tell you, oh, you know, if you make a donation to us, we'll find the dog a new home. And I knew some of these people. And people would call and say, well, you know, what happens to the dog afterwards? How come I can never have contact with the dog? I can't know where the dog went. And I'll tell you why. Because these people take your thousand, two thousand, twenty five hundred dollars $2,500. They keep the dog for a couple of weeks. They put the dog down and they pocket your money. 
Because with the rare exception of somebody that's actually going to take a dog like this and work this dog, first of all, if the dog has a deep-seated aggression, right, an aggression that's either medically inherent or that is, um, is, is acquired through not socializing and not training, these are very, very hard things to change, especially if it's from an early age on. You don't wave a magic wand. There's no magic bullet. I know you guys watch the show on TV and think, well, I've seen, I saw Caesar do it. Didn't do it. Right? The dogs didn't have that ingrained, hardcore aggression. Those dogs are sitting in shelters. I've worked with those dogs. And I can tell you, you can work through the behaviors, but the behaviors are still there. You can manage the behaviors, but they never go away. You can't cure it. If it's deep-seated, it can be managed at best. But bad traits, bad behaviors, especially if they're in the core of the dog. The dog didn't have a great life until it was two or three years old and then suddenly get in a fight and have kind of a chip on its shoulder that we can kind of knock off and train out. This dog has this nature from birth. Whether it's inbred into the dog or it's acquired by the dog at an early age through lack of socialization, lack of training, and lack of structure, the dog won't lose that. So if you're struggling with a dog that's aggressive and you're wondering what the best decision to make is, listen to what I'm telling you. Consult a balanced trainer. Watch your dog. If the dog is giving off warning signals, super stiffness, highly alert, hackles up, fearlessly, aggressively growling, barking, lunging, doing these things, the dog doesn't respond. Chances are the dog has some kind of an issue. Right? You need to get it sussed out. You need to get a couple opinions. It's not a decision to make lightly. But I will tell you, I've seen these dogs, and on several occasions, I myself have said, that dog needs to be put down. And when I make that call, when I've made that decision, it's a decision that does not come lightly. It's a, it's a situation that I hate to make. But because there are a lot of good dogs in the shelters, in the rescues, in the humane societies, the SPCAs and everything, I truly believe that getting yourself a good dog, whether it's from a rescue or from a good breeder, is the best decision you're going to make. A dog should enhance your life. A dog should not be a burden upon you. And all too often, when you get a dog like this and someone guilts you into taking a dog like this, you're putting yourself in a position that you will not be happy in. Don't let someone talk you into a dog that you don't want. Don't let them tell you, oh, the dog just needs some training, the dog just needs this, the dog just needs that. All dogs need training. All dogs need socialization. But you want to start off with a nice clean slate or a nice balanced, well-behaved dog. Not being good on a leash or being a little feisty or high drive is not the end of the world. But a dog that shows severe inability to cope with other dogs in its presence or a severe aggression around things that trigger its prey drive. And remember, the prey drive, the predatory drive is the innate nature of the dog. It's a predator. So if the dog has not been trained or bred in a manner that will allow the dog to control its prey drive, it can chase balls and frisbees and this and that, and that's one thing. But to try to run after, kill, growl, lunging at, becoming stiff at, showing poor social signs towards things like children on bicycles, skateboards, uh, cars driving by, other animals, and getting into a deep, aggression over those things 
oftentimes an indication of a dog that can't function in society. It cannot be successful in society. And because of that, it shouldn't be allowed to be in a position where it can endanger the life of a child, another dog, or any other person. And I stand by that. I stand by that with a lot of experience in the shelters, with rescue dogs, with severely aggressive dogs, because I've worked with them. I've seen them, I know what they're capable of, and I know what can be done. Most often than not, an owner is not equipped to give their own dog a firm enough correction for this type of behavior. There's no clicker training in the world that will fix that. If the aggression or frustration or misunderstanding of the drive can be fixed with a clicker or positive only training, then the behavior was never there in the first place. I can promise you that. Anybody who says, oh, I cured this dog by just doing positive training and just doing this and condition to this and condition to that, that dog didn't really have an issue. And kudos to, to you, that trainer, for having been able to do that. Because whenever you can condition a dog with positive training versus compulsion training, excellent. But it must be able to be proofed. It must be able to be brought through, reintroduced to these stimuluses, and then prove that it's not triggered by them anymore. More often than not, that will be done through a balanced training method, through corrections and rewards. That's not to say it's not positive. Because if you don't reward the dog positively for not acting on its aggression, you're not going to get anything out of the dog. The dog must receive a reward for doing the right thing, whether it's not by not putting a correction on or by giving it a treat, by giving it a tug, or by giving it praise. The dog must be rewarded. Ignoring the positive action of, of choosing not to go after the other dog is a rewardable behavior. We reward the dog for that. And by rewarding them, we teach the dog that that is the behavior we, we, we wanted. So this email was very, very powerful to me. Here and there, I share my, you know, an email and try to explain to you how important it is that people understand that making the right decision with a dog is not sometimes very popular. Just like a, a, a friend of mine and client who asked me, he wanted to get another rescue dog after he had this rescue dog and has four kids now. And I said, please get a dog from a good lab breeder. And he did, and he's so happy. Getting the right dog is the right decision. Trying to do the right thing because it makes you feel good or you've been guilted into it is not the right thing. Don't do what makes you feel uncomfortable when it's going to put someone else at risk. Do things that make you uncomfortable by learning more, by educating yourself, by going to work out, by, by, by opening your mind to other people's opinions. But don't do it by bringing a dog into your home that's going to make your life miserable. And so often, so often this is the case with people. So I'm here to tell you as somebody who's worked with a lot of dogs, who's had a lot of experience with this, that you should find the best dog for you. If you have a family, get yourself a nice family pet that will, that will do well with your children, that will do well with people who come over and visit. That'll be a nice dog to take out on a walk. There's a dog here in the neighborhood. It's a golden retriever, and he's just the sweetest, nicest dog. He came from a breeder, and he'll never end up in a shelter. So he's not part of the problem. So when people say, well, when you buy a dog from a breeder, that affects the dogs in shelters. No, it doesn't. Because it doesn't end that dog going into the shelter. You know what affects dogs in shelters? People breeding dogs in backyards with bad temperaments and bad health issues that are then later dumped in the shelter. That's what affects the shelters. That's what affects shelter dogs. Getting a well-bred, well-socialized, uh, genetically uh, healthy dog that you can handle, that you'll be responsible for, will not affect the dog's lives in the shelters. Because there will always be people who want dogs out of shelters. And there should be, because there's so many great dogs in the shelters. Make the decision carefully. If it's not the right dog, don't get it. Don't play a hero that you can't be. You're not Superman, don't jump off a building. You're not a dog trainer, don't get a dog that needs a lot of excessive training. 
Train every dog you get, basics, make sure the dog understands, make sure you can handle the dog, you understand the dog, the dog will fit into your lifestyle and you'll have a happy life. God bless this couple here for doing the right thing, for not putting that dog back into a system that would then end up killing another dog and if this dog ever got out, it would hurt another dog. And that's my take on it and that's where I'm gonna stand on it. So, hope you enjoyed that, I hope you listened to it, I hope it makes sense to you and I certainly hope it helps to save a dog's life and helps to keep a person safe. I will hopefully see you back here in a week. I, t- I took one week off from the podcast. Sometimes I do that, but sometimes uh, I'm just looking for a good topic. If you haven't done so yet, check out my membership section at robertcabral.com. Subscribe to my YouTube channel. Follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and uh, Twitter. I'm starting to use Twitter more. And uh, share the word and give your dog a big hug. <laughs>